Hello, everybody. Thank you for attending CXC 2020. My name is Jersey Drozd. I am the interim executive director of CartoonCrossroadsColumbus.org. And uh, while I have your attention, um, I would like to say that Cartoon Crossroads Columbus is a 5013C nonprofit, and we are sponsored by the Ohio Arts Council, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, White Castle, Columbus Foundation, Abel and Fiesel. We thank them for their support. We couldn't do this. This, this is a big uh, expansive festival with a lot of amazing things happening, and we just couldn't do it without all of that uh, support. Also, oh, I should keep the screen sharing going because I got a little bit of housekeeping that I'd like to do, if you don't mind, everybody. Um, here we go. So this is a presentation followed by some Q&A, um, some really amazing content and information and thinking is coming your way. It's surely going to inspire you to wonder about things and you can share those thoughts at the end by, by a Q&A. You can actually uh, post questions. I'll show you how in a second. Um, you have been automatically muted by the host and your video is off. You saw that on the bullet point up on the screen and we are recording this presentation um, for posterity because this is gonna be so good. You're gonna wanna watch it twice. Um, how to participate in the webinar. So. In the Q&A section, we are going to give you the opportunity to use your voice to interact with us. So you can actually ask a question and we can hear the intonation. We can get that extra context of the sound of your voice. And the way you do that, the way you let us know is by raising your hand. There's a little raise, raise your hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. But if you want to participate via just chat, you can chat amongst yourselves with the chat function, or you can actually ask questions. Now, why, why wouldn't you just use the chat? Because if you use the Q&A, I click Q&A, this little box pops up and you have the option to send anonymously. So maybe you wanna ask a question, but you don't necessarily want us to read your name on the, the live stream. Perfectly reasonable, uh, happy to accommodate you there. Just make sure that you post your question in the Q&A with the send anonymously tab. We are streaming this live on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch. Anybody who's watching live there, you can post your comments in those streams. We are watching all of them and we can relay those questions to our wonderful panel of experts. Now with that, I will close and I will hand it over to our, one of my favorite people in the entire world, Jenny Robb. Why, thank you, Jersey. It's so exciting to be part of the first ever virtual CXC. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, if you don't know me, I'm the curator of the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at The Ohio State University. And I've worked here for about 15 years. And in that time, I've seen uh, cartoon and comics artwork stored in just about every possible way, both good and bad. And I've also seen all kinds of conservation problems and issues. So today, I'll be giving a short presentation about the basics of preserving your cartoon and comics art with some tips and best practices. Now, the idea isn't that everyone here will be able to achieve perfection uh, in terms of preserving your art at home, but really just to give you an idea of what the risks are and how you can mitigate them. So I should say right up front that I'm not a conservator. Uh, here at the Billy Ireland, we rely on our wonderful colleagues uh, to help us with our preservation and conservation. And two of them are here with me today. Um, Miriam Santano is the Ohio State University Library's Preservation and Digitization Strategist. And Marcella Estevez is our Head of Conservation. So uh, they'll be joining me later on the, uh, for the Q&A. Meanwhile, if you want to ask them questions, they're here now, and they'll be happy to try to answer your questions in chat. Um, if, if your question requires a longer answer, they might save it and wait um, till they can answer it verbally uh, in the Q&A. So I also want to just say that I'm going to focus on works on paper, cartoon and comics art that are works on paper, but you're welcome to ask questions about any other kinds of materials that you have. Um, so with that, um, let's get started. And I will share my screen. I hope. Okay. I hope everybody is looking at uh, my title slide, Paper, Pencils, and Pigments, Caring for Your Artwork at Home. Okay. I think this is going to work. Um, when we talk about preservation, we're really talking about taking care of things we value so they can be shared with future generations. 
And the goal here is to minimize chemical and physical deterioration and damage to prolong the object's existence. Now, in libraries and museums and archives, we have a whole set of policies and procedures that are undertaken in order to carry out this uh, stewardship. But at home, uh, preserving your personal collections is really about paying careful attention to the choices you make about the materials you use, the containers and the spaces that you house them in, and the environmental conditions where they are stored. So my preservation colleagues have identified what they call the agents of deterioration. And I, always, whenever I hear that, I always think it sounds like it should be a supervillain team, like uh, the Legion of Supervillains or the Masters of Evil. So let's take a look at what these agents of deterioration are. They come in two categories. The first is internal factors. This is basically inherent vice. So that means that the object or material uh, has a tendency to deteriorate or self-destruct because of its intrinsic or internal characteristics. And these include things like weak construction, poor quality or unstable media, or incompa incompatibility of different materials within an object. And they may lead to natural deterioration or make an object more susceptible to uh, uh, the second category of the agents of deterioration which is external factors. So external factors includes everything from vandals to water to incorrect temperature and humidity. And in the preservation field, we consider all of these agents when we make decisions about how to take care of collections. So I wanna start by talking about uh, choosing materials. So any of you that are still working old school with actual, um, illustration board or paper and pencils and ink, uh, you do want to think about the factors of inherent vice when you're uh, choosing what kinds of materials that you want to use. Um, so of course, first you have to have a support. You want to use acid-free archival quality papers and boards whenever possible. Uh, and this really is the foundation for the long-term well-being of your art. You can see here some, a couple of items that um, are in our collection that were damaged. Um, paper and boards that are poorly manufactured tend to, to deteriorate at a faster pace um, due to the presence of chemicals used to break down the wood pulp. So uh, you definitely want to consider that when you're thinking about what kinds of uh, materials to use. If your paper has suffered severe damage due to either intrinsic or external agents or a combination of both, um, I do recommend that you work with a conservator um, rather than trying to repair it yourself. Okay, so you've got your support. So now what are you going to use uh, to create your cartoons and comics? Um, this is a picture actually of the things that Bill Watterson used to create uh, Calvin and Hobbes. We had an exhibition and, and we had these on display. Um, a few years back. So when you're choosing things like inks, you want to consider their durability and their longevity. Um, one factor is light fastness. So that is um, basically means how long it will last before it starts to fade. And there are a couple different rating systems for light fastness. Um, India Ink has a, a very high light fastness rating. But things like markers and felt tip pens, including Sharpies, um, do not. So those will fade. Um, that's an inherent vice. So they will fade even if they're not exposed to light. And I'll show you a couple things from our collection just to get an idea. Those of you who, uh, who've used these materials are probably pretty familiar with this. Um, this is a, a Dilbert cartoon by Scott Adams, and he uses a marker that is known to fade. But he, we have a note that came with this original where he's telling the person that he gave it to, to be careful, the water used ink fades in light. So he was uh, giving them fair warning. And in this Jim Barry's world, we're, we're seeing even a more extreme case of that where the black marker has faded all the way to yellow. Um, so there's really not a lot you can do about that if you have works of art that, um, that use these types of, of markers. Um, but you can try to slow down the process by keeping them out of light and keeping them in the dark at all times. You can also look for um, uh, archival or fade resistant products with high um, light fast ratings. So those are available on the market as well. 
So another example of inherent vice, uh, many of you are probably familiar with screen tones or they used to be called, was called zipatone. Um, it often discolors like this. And we have lots and lots of artwork here. Um, the Billy Island Cartoon Library Museum has over 300,000 originals. And a lot of our work does have Zipatone and it does discolor the way you can see um, in this comic strip. The, the cause of that is actually oxidation. So um, it's a chemical degradation that is a form of rusting. And again, this is inherent, so it will happen regardless of what you do. And here we have uh, two uh, cartoons from one of my favorite collections that we have here, Jim Borgman. Um, and there might be a chance that Jim Borgman is with us, uh, which I wasn't expecting, but uh, I love these cartoons. Uh, this kind of paper is called Duo Shade, and it was really popular with editorial cartoonists um, in the late uh, 20th century. That sounds like a long time ago. It wasn't really. Uh, but basically, there was a, a shading pattern that you would put a chemical on to, to bring it up. Um, sometimes it had two, a duo shade, and you would use a different chemical to bring up a, a second pattern. Um, but unfortunately, this also tends to discolor and either darken or fade um, with age. Uh, but I, I do love these cartoons. I love especially the one on the right in election season here. We've got uh, Jimmy Carter searching for the non-voters who are asleep at his feet. And just so you can see it even close, uh, more of a close up of what that duo shade paper looks like. So again, this is um, mater materials that have an inherent vice. Um, they probably are going to discolor. Um, you really can't stop it, but you can hopefully um, slow it down if you keep it in the dark. So if you're adhering or attaching something to your artwork, um, these are things that we absolutely don't want you to use. So one of them is rubber cement. Um, also tapes like scotch tape, masking tape, cellophane tape, duct tape, I'm sorry. Um, I have seen people using that. You shouldn't be using that on your art. Um, that all of that will, will eventually damage the artwork. Um, you can get alter, uh, archival alternatives um, and those are available at stores um, or websites like Gaylord, Hollinger Metal Edge and University Products. Um, also, if you want to keep, um, keep things together, like for example, say you want to print out uh, a final version of your work, uh, maybe you started out with, with a, a drawing or a cartoon on paper, you scanned it in, you made corrections, you colored it, um, and then you want to keep a, a paper version of both of those. Um, don't use paper clips, um, either put them together in a folder, preferably an acid-free folder, uh, or just store them adjacent to each other. So just to show you what um, the rubber cement looks like after many decades, um, this is a uh, Terry and the Pirates original by Milton Kniff. It's from the 1930s. And what's interesting about this piece, you can see that he had cut out all of the panels. The reason for this is that there were two different formats at the time. And he would draw it in a vertical format, photograph it, cut out all the panels, re-paste um, them up as a horizontal format, because of course this was in the days before Photoshop, uh, and, and then that would be the original. So um, he used rubber cement, and as you can see, it turns brittle, it turns yellow, and the, the paste ups just really pop right off very, very easily. Um, so you do want to be careful also with what you use if you have any work like this, um, with what you reaffix it with. Um, different papers, um, require different kinds of adhesives. So if you can, can consult with a conservator, that's always the best option. Um, but certainly what you want to do is use an archival or and reversible adhesive if you're going to reattach paste ups like this that have come off. So this is not really a preservation issue, but as a curator, it's a, um, a plea from me and all the other curators and librarians in the world. Um, and that is to date your work. So in this Crazy Cat original that we have here, um, we can see the date. Um, he's written it there and most comic strips, uh, a lot of comic strips will often have um, copyright notices with the date. So this is great for us. It saves us many hours of, of trying to figure out what the date of the work is. But if you're an artist, and again, you're still working old school, um, if the date is not obvious or part of your signature, please turn your work over and uh, just write the date in pencil. Um, librarians and curators and biographers will, will thank you. Okay, so we've talked about 
uh, inherent vice. Um, now we'll talk about the external factors of uh, the external agents of deterioration. So these include things like human behavior, either um, through damage or neglect, um, exposures to risks like uh, fire, um, flooding, pollutants, as well as poor environmental, environmental conditions. So that could um, be exposure to light and UV rays. It could be incorrect temperature or humidity, um, which can then lead to things like mold. Um, and also there are things like pests. So lots of uh, agents of deterioration here to be concerned about. So when we talk about proper storage, a good way to think about it is to think about Russian nesting dolls. This is a um, great cartoon from Mike Peters. We have his archives here at the library. Uh, you have your object, which inherently has an interior core and an exterior perimeter. It's nestled in some kind of enclosure or enclosures. Uh, it's placed in a room, which is part of a larger building, which is located in a certain climate region. So each of these levels from the core of the object to the outdoor weather can potentially have distinct environments or what we call microclimates. And they could have different temperatures and relative humidity values, um, you know, depending on the situation. So what we want to do is diminish the effects of the agents of deterioration on our collections, and it's important to consider each of these levels. So we're going to start, we're going to work from the outside in, just like we would uh, with a Russian nesting doll. So first you have uh, the climate that you live in, and all climates have different challenges. Um, this is a, a interactive map that the New York Times recently posted. I think it's really fascinating. It shows uh, what are the biggest risks um, in the next few decades um, based on the county that you live in? And it, as I said, it's interactive. You can actually go to this site and find your county and find out um, what the biggest risks, risks are in terms of the environment. Now, obviously, there's not much we can do about that, um, although we do hope that the buildings, or the house that we live in will protect us and our artworks from some of the extremes here. The best option is to uh, store your work, regardless of the climate, um, in a cool, climate-controlled, dry place with minimum fluctuations of temperature and humidity. So our tendency um, is to store things uh, in places, uh, especially things that we don't, we don't need access to uh, or don't regularly access. We tend to store them in places that um, we don't spend a lot of time because there are areas where we have space. But the rule of thumb here is that if you're not comfortable in the space um, year round, then probably your artwork will not be comfortable in that space because the things, um, the conditions that make us uncomfortable could also be damaging to the artwork. Um, so of course, this means basements uh, can be problematic. Um, many of them are moist, many of them uh, are prone to flooding. Attics can also be very problematic, um, again, depending on your house, depending on your attic and the climate that you're in. And of course, garages. Um, so all of these areas, if they're not climate controlled, run the risk of extreme temperatures, high humidity, rapid changes in temperature and hum humidity, as well as things like pests and mold. So if you do have to keep your art in an area that's not climate controlled, uh, we do have some recommendations. Um, first of all, the climate that you're in might determine if you have a choice, whether you want to put something in your basement or your garage or your attic. Um, and you also might want to consider if the seasons change, uh, moving the, your storage containers, if that's possible, if um, during some seasons one area is better than another area. But the, the real key here and, and the, one of the biggest takeaways I hope you get from this presentation is that if you have your uh, artwork stored in the less than ideal conditions, you want to inspect your collection for signs of deterioration or pests or mold. And you want to do this on a regular basis. Um, so I, I know I'm guilty of this. I tend to um, put my, my treasures in, in some kind of a box and then I you know, hide them away and I don't look at them for years. Um, what you really want to try to do is get in the habit of just opening the drawers or the boxes, whatever you're keeping your art in, and, and inspecting them, and even in uh, actually airing them out. So this is a, uh, something that um, uh, our preservation colleagues recommend, uh, that you actually air out your, your treasures from time to time. 
if you can have a dehumidifier in a space that's damp, that's obviously ideal, um, or keep the area ventilated in some way. Um, regardless of where you have it, uh, again, ventilation is key. So for example, even if you have your artwork stored in a closet that's, um, uh, that's climate controlled, you might want to leave that closet door open all the time to make sure there's, uh, there's constant ventilation. And regardless of where you have um, your art stored, whether it's climate controlled or not, you might want to keep a sensor like this one. Um, this is, I'm not endorsing this brand in particular, but this is just one that, I, that, um, that I'm aware of that uh, is not very expensive. But if you keep a sensor like this, this particular one will tell you the highs and the lows for the day, which is nice. Um, so you can kind of monitor and see if there's a real problem, see if there's a problem before it leads to something even worse. And another option, of course, to consider is running a storage facility that's climate controlled. So let's talk about housing your art. Um, you want to think about uh, what the materials are in the art, whether the art is fragile, whether it needs um, support from a, from a board or um, a folder. Um, you also want to consider the media. So is it friable? That means does it flake or smudge, things like Conte crayon or charcoal. In most cases, um, metal flat files or acid-free boxes are both excellent choices. Uh, you do want to be careful with wooden flat files. For example, unpainted wood can emit gases that will discolor artwork. Um, also, regular cardboard can be very problematic, so you do want to really try to get acid-free if possible. Um, a lot of people store art in clear plastic sleeves made from an inert polyester film like mylar. If you do that, uh, I recommend, our, our, our preservation colleagues recommend that you leave two of the sides open, again, so you're not creating a microclimate inside um, the artwork. And you also want to be careful never to use um, mylar with uh, friable media like Conte crayon or uh, charcoal like this beautiful Eldon Dadini rough. Um, we have Eldon's archives here and he used to uh, do these amazing roughs with charcoal um, for his Playboy and his uh, New Yorker cartoons. So I often get asked about plastic bins and um, in some ways it can be very tempting because it could help mitigate some kinds of risks but uh, my, my preservation colleagues uh, are very firm in this. Try to avoid storing your materials in airtight um, enclosures or things that don't breathe. And the reason for that is that they can get heat and humidity and pollutants from off-gassing of the materials. Those can be trapped inside, just like a greenhouse effect um, for the earth. So uh, that can actually accelerate, accelerate the degradation of the work. So, do avoid um, plastic bins, um, that's the rule. There are maybe some exceptions, uh, and I don't know if Miriam or Marcella want to talk more about this. Um, for example, if you have to store your art in a, in a damp or humid area, um, and you want to tr purposely try to create a microclimate and use a desiccant to absorb some of the moisture, that could be an example, but you have to be really careful because a desiccant has to be regularly checked, regularly changed. Um, so, so you would certainly want to, um, to only do that if you absolutely need to and if you're willing to, um, to do the work in, in periodically checking it. So here are uh, a couple of resources. There's tons of stuff online, and I just want, want to mention this because um, Miriam and Marcella have helped us with a list of links that will be on our website, cartoons.osu.edu, if you go to um, the Preserve Your Cartoon Art page. And we have a bunch of links that could be helpful for you. So if you do mat and frame your cartoon and comics art to hang on the wall, um, there are definitely a couple of things to pay attention to. Um, one, of course, you want to use acid-free materials for the mat board and the, uh, the hinges. Um, you want to use a UV resistant plexi. Um, I also recommend uh, not storing, not uh, hanging your art in a room that has a lot of sunlight um, or that has any fluorescent light. Um, both of those are sources of UV light, which will damage your artwork, uh, even if you have a UV plexi, if, especially if you keep things up for, for years or decades. Um, this is an example of Lynn Johnston, for better or for worse. 
um, that does appear like it was matted and framed and on someone's wall for quite a long time. So you can see the discoloration there. The other thing to, to watch out for is a lot of times um, cartoonists uh, will sign or uh, sign their work with a marker that is not, um, that will fade. And so you want to be careful if you've got something matted and framed, if there's an inscription or a signature that's important to you, um, that could fade much faster than the actual original if they've used India ink, for example. Um, so be quite careful with that. Um, I do recommend if, if the piece is really important um, to make a reproduction of it and mat and frame that and keep the original uh, stored in a, in a safe, dark, cool place. And uh, just to show you what I do at home, uh, my husband and I have, have some cartoon art and we have, the, we have it hanging on, on a landing that gets no sunlight at all. Um, and then we do also hang some in our guest bathroom. Uh, the key here is don't put it in a bathroom where there's a shower or a bath because you definitely don't want to expose the work to any moisture. So speaking of uh, moisture, uh, if your works do get water damage, there's a flood or a leak or, or something else happens, um, the best thing that you can do is remove the items as quickly as possible from the area. Uh, remove them from any wet folders or boxes or framing and to air dry them flat as quickly as possible. You wanna have a well-ventilated area, use fans if necessary. Um, the idea is to dry the artwork as fast as possible so you don't give mold an opportunity to take root. Uh, mold is definitely um, the enemy here and one of the most problematic of the agents of deterioration. So you can, if you do have um, uh, water damage, uh, contact a conservator or there are, are companies who specialize in this kind of thing. So if you have that option, I would recommend that they can, um, they can do other types of measures like freeze drying and, uh, and really monitor to be sure that, that the works of art dry correctly and there's no additional damage. So again, speaking about moisture, let's talk about mold. So my colleagues uh, remind me that mold spores, both active or dormant, are everywhere. Uh, and we don't really notice them um, until uh, they've managed to uh, colonize in substantially high numbers. So what happens is the mold propagates by disseminating spores, which become airborne, travel to new locations, and they can germinate under the right conditions. Um, so what are the right conditions? The right conditions are, of course, um, high temperatures and high humidity. And this process can happen very quickly. It can happen within 24 to 48 hours. So you really do want to um, uh, stay on top of any artwork that's stored in any kind of a condition that might reach um, high temperatures or high humidity. So I just want to give you some examples. These are not from my collection, uh, or my collection, They're not from our collection here at Billy Ireland. Um, but they show you kind of an extreme examples of the kind of damage that mold can do. All mold though isn't visible. Another way that you can detect if there's a problem is by smell. So if you um, smelled something that's is like damp or musty, um, that can give you an early warning that there's a problem and you need to take care of the environment where you're storing your art. And finally, we have pests. So uh, these are some agents of, uh, of deterioration supervillains here, silverfish, cockroaches, rodents, um, and the damage that they can cause. You don't always see those uh, um, creatures or critters, um, but you sometimes see the evidence of them. So this is uh, my favorite slide that my, my colleagues provided to me. This is pest droppings or frass, that's a new word, I did not know. That's actually um, basically insect poop. Uh, so here's a, a little chart that will show you. If you do see anything like this in the area where you're storing your art, especially if it's in a garage or a basement or an attic, uh, you certainly wanna investigate and figure out um, if you have some kind of an infestation that you can take care of. So on that cheery slide, uh, we'll, we'll move to uh, a Calvin and Hobbes original um, I picked this one because it's election season, uh, and this is one of my favorite series. Um, but I wanted to, uh, to basically just summarize by saying, 
that the idea here is to choose high quality archival materials when you create art, to consider the best room in your home to store your art, uh, to choose whenever possible a cool, dry, stable, dark environment that is well ventilated and monitored. And however you store uh, your cartoon and comics art, you should certainly check it periodically so you can catch problems early. And here's our website, cartoons.osu.edu. I mentioned before, we have more information and links on our resources. If you go to resources and then preserving cartoon art. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And ask Marcella and Miriam to turn on their cameras. Here they are. Okay, thank you. I see that you all have been um, putting some things in chat. Thank you for clarifying and expanding what I was talking about. Uh, do you have any comments you want to make to start us off based on, um, on what, we, what we've been talking about? Um, I'll start off. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, that was a great summary and um, a, a, a great explainer to this audience of, of all the considerations we need to take to um, make sure that we are sorting our collections at home. One of the questions that I mistakenly tried to do in the Q&A, and I don't think I did it as uh, correctly or successfully, I put it in the chat, is the question about what is the ideal temperature and humidity for works of art? Now, of course, that will change depending on the media and also on the, the kind of support paper or board that the item is. But you also have to remember that you're going to be storing this at home. So you're going to have to balance both human comfort with what's best for the artifact, right? So um, I put in the chat that, well, think about home. How do you like it? What's the temperature you want? 65 is chilly for some people. But up to 70 is our threshold for artwork. So you want to find a happy medium there. And then in terms of humidity, we really try to avoid going over 50%. That's really hard in some households because the HVAC system is not able to work that well or that hard, constantly removing humidity. So, you know, I, there are some studies that are going lately to say that 60% in some cases as long as you have a very stable environment, that's the important thing. To avoid having these constant spikes up and down, but a stable environment that maybe gradually moves with the season, as we tend to do in our houses, we tend to calibrate to the hot in the summer and the cold in the winter. So do our, our, our treasures. Um, yeah, anything else you'd like to add, Marcella? No, I think that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, if you would like to ask a question verbally, uh, you can raise your hand and I hope that I'll be able to see that or one of my um, tech people will help me. Uh, and then we can uh, uh, help you unmute, unmute so that you can ask your question um, or you can also put other questions into chat. If you also, I mentioned that I'm, I you know, was focusing on, on cartoon and comics art for this particular presentation. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about um, animation art. Uh, that's another big topic. <laughs> if anybody on this call is interested in that, um, you feel free to ask about other, other types of things that I, that I didn't cover. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A. And Jenny, this is for you probably. Does Billy Arlen have a art saving process in case of power outage? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we do. We have a generator that would, would turn on in the case of a power outage. And uh, so this is a good, good one um, from Craig. You mentioned not storing artwork with charcoal or crayon and mylar. Can you elaborate? Yeah, um, you know, we tend to use fixatives, of course, for the charcoal and the pastel, but the mylar has static, which means it can pull the media from the paper, then we don't want to store, especially if it's a miler like sleeve, right? And you're pushing your artwork in and out there, part of the media can be held back 
in the mirror, then it's always better to cover that type of paper in a paper, cover with archival paper quality, you know, folders or a piece of paper to interleave between the artwork that you are storing. Great, and is that true even if uh, an artist has fixed the, um, the charcoal? Oh yeah. Yeah. If you fix it, yeah, you need to be super careful because even with the fixative, you know, but we tend, when we put the fixative, you know, we tend to touch to see, oh, how much is pulling or is really fixed. But over time, also, you can have some degradation of the fixative, which means that you don't know what's chemically happening there and the media can start, you know, to release from the paper. You don't know if it's really fixed to the paper. Yeah. Great, so another great question, um, something I didn't cover in the presentation. Would you explain foxing on paper and what can be done about it, if anything? Medium. So there are a couple of different types of foxing. Um, we're talking about that speckly dark type of either yellow or darkish, darkish brown type of stains that are happening in the paper. Um, those stains are coming from two possible different origins. Either there was a mold issue on the paper, and actually that created that pattern of foxing, or in the process of paper making itself, the water or the, the materials, the, the actual paper pulp, um, were somehow impregnated with metal. So therefore, with time, as we talked already about oxidation, some of that metal within the paper starts to rust. And that's what may cause some of the issues. So either one is actually an indication that there is something wrong with the temperature and the humidity, mostly the humidity in which these items are stored. So that's, that's a good sign that something's wrong and you may want to address it before it gets too bad. Great. And, uh, you know, if you are thinking foxing and I can do anything about that, um, well, if you go to a conservator and you're really concerned about reversing the stains, um, they will offer different alternatives of bleaching. Now, the, the tendency nowadays is trying not to wash or bleach the paper because it does interfere with the qualities of you know the paper it will degrade easier after you do a bleaching because of oxidation of the fiber and because you lose when you wash you lose the sizing that is part of the fabrication of the paper but always consult the conservator our uh, choice if you want it nowadays like if it's not interfering with the content of the art piece or in a book we won't do anything about foxing, but just try to keep the materials in good environmental conditions to avoid further damage. That's basically, yeah. Okay, uh, great question. I heard no plastic bins, but most of us can't store thousands of cartoons and flat files. What would be a reasonable choice of container to store big quantities of art on paper? Do you want to take that, Marcela, or do you want me? Go ahead, go ahead. All right, so say that you do have a safe enough space that you're not concerned with um, any flooding, for example. Um, record storage boxes are actually pretty good. They are pretty large. You can put a lot of material in them of different sizes. And uh, I'm, I'm not thinking oversized art. That, there we have to sort of look at different, different uh, containers. But if you're talking about things that fit more or less into a, a, a regular record storage box, even if it's not the ideal archival material, that box will be much better than nothing at all. And, and better than a, a closed, um, non-breathable climate like a plastic bin? Absolutely, because again, you do want the, at, at least the material to be able to breathe and to expand and contract and not to have humidity trapped within the container. Uh, so someone did point out, um, I mentioned dating your art um, as a favor to, to future librarians and curators. Um, if you're using numerical form of the date, please be sure to indicate somehow, uh, whether it's the US or the European version. Uh, you can also write the actual words, you know, January 15th and then the year if you, if you want to be sure. Uh, 
When selling my own original prints, I often sign them with pencil. How does pencil do over time? Pencil is good. It's very stable. You know, it's, um, if you can fix it, it's better. <laughs> also, if you wrap that can, you know, you can lose the day, right? But no, pencil is very stable. You know, that's something that you can trust. And like we were telling, if you are going to do ink, you know, India ink is good. Um, if you want something more permanent that you know it won't damage over time from rubbing against other materials. And what about mylar and pencil? Is that okay? Mylar and pencil, it, yeah, it's more, it's, um, I think it's, there is more, um, we can say it grabs better to the paper, the pencil, than the charcoal and the pastel. But also, if there is, this is the issue, but I think there is, there is very, very few chances it could happen. If the paper starts to break down and the paper is very fragile, you know, and cannot hold the media, that's where you will have issues, right? Because then you don't have a support that is good for anything. And that probably we can compare also what happened before as well. I was talking about the fixative degradating, but of course, if the support starts to lose its integrity, because um, like you talked before, like the materials degrade chemically, you know, and then you will have the same issue with any media you have there. You won't able to hold any of the media. So we have a couple questions. Um, uh, Bob says, are the plastic sleeves in portfolios safe for storing comic book art or do you also recommend using a mylar sleeve inside the portfolio sleeves? Oh, so we're talking about a regular portfolio you, that you get off. Um, so it, that we could actually have a whole hour just talking about plastics and polymers and polyesters. Um, so, so generally, um, you'd have to be suspect of plastics, right, Marcela? Yes, I mean, plastics. Unless, unless the product tells you what type of plastic it is, you would want to put some other kind of buffer in between your artwork and that plastic and not keep that plastic, that artwork there indefinitely. So you're just going to use it for that one occasion where you need to show your artwork and then you would remove it and put it in its more permanent storage. And uh, another similar question, I store my art in mylars and then in Itoya portfolios. Is that too airtight? I don't trust Itoya's claims of archivability. I'm not familiar with those portfolios. Are you, Marcela? No, I was going to ask, I, is that a brand, Itoya? Is a brand? I, I believe so, but I'm actually not familiar with it either. So Jeff, you've you've stumped us. <laughs> Put something in. Uh, <laughs> the principle yes, is if they're brand. not it's a brand. It's a brand. Yeah, the principle is if the artwork not uh, being ventilated and it's just airtight, then you may want to reconsider how to store it rather than than in that portfolio for the long term. We don't want to over the storage, you know. Mm -hmm. We want to try to find a balance, yeah. So uh, we have a question about conservation for original cartoon cells, so animation cells. Oh. Yeah, that is actually a very, very specialized um, area. Um, it's kind of like when you have a, a, a general doctor, general medicine, and then you need a specialist for your heart or your, your brain. Um, I think, you know, we would have to look for specific people, but th there are people who, who dedicate themselves to that, and we could get back to you offline to, to be able to get you those, those contacts. Yeah. Yeah, there's some special storage containers um, specifically designed. What we use here at the Billy Ireland um, is a special storage container. Uh, it, it's like a mat. It's really like a folder, but um, uh, it... That's the ideal, if, if you can do it. Unfortunately, they're, they're not inexpensive and they're all, they also take up a lot of space. We have a couple, one question. Do you have a software recommendation for maintaining a record of artwork inventory? I don't know, Jenny. 
So here at the Billy Ireland, we use a software called Pass Perfect. Um, I don't know, that's a, that's a museum software. I don't know if, if there's a version for, for consumers for private collections, um, but that's what we use here. And then somebody's asking if treated um, well, can poor quality paper, for example, all comic books still last a very long time? Um, yeah, yeah, a second question I think that goes with that, which is mentioning animation art, there are roughs and storyboards that are on essentially pulp paper. So again, we're talking about low quality yeah. paper um, and are there safe products for deacidifying those or what, what do you recommend? Miriam, you want to talk a little? Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was trying to follow the chat, so I kind of um, zoned out a little bit. So about poor quality paper, sometimes you can get away with um, helping poor quality paper if you put buffered paper, mm -hmm. literally paper that has an um, alkaline buffer in it that helps um, mitigate some of the acidic issues of the poor quality paper. So you can sort of put a kind of like interleaving poor materials with better materials. And that will help it sort of um, within that little microclimate that we're causing in that folder to actually diminish the acidic release that the poor quality paper would do. And um, buffer, so yeah. you want to explain a little buffers just in case? Yeah, so we, we remember when we talked about paper making in the, in the water, sometimes we can get metals. Well, one of the things that paper makers do to try to make sure that the paper lasts a little longer is we put very basic or alkaline materials in them, alkaline earth metals in, to be precise. And that will help the paper fight off acidity in time. So we call it a buffer because it's actually creating a buffer in time. It releases alkalinity in time mm -hmm. to fight off either its own inherent acidity or the acidity of the neighbor. Because that's, I don't know if you've noticed, if you put a piece of newsprint in, on top of a nice piece of paper, you'll, you'll see yellowing being transferred over to the nice piece of paper. That's acid migration, right? right. But if you have buffered paper, that's going to be fighting, resisting that bit of acid migration at that time. So um, we have a question uh, from Facebook. Wow. Sorry, I just lost it. Uh, with framed art, is it important to use a spacer to keep the paper separated from the glass? Yes, so what the mat is doing, the function of a mat is to create that space so that the work of art is never touching the, art, the glass directly, right? Um, and so depending on the type of media, you would have either one or two layers of mat. And then people get really fancy with multiple window showings, right? Um, in the case of cell art, um, what Jennifer described as, uh, I'm sorry, Jenny described as very um, expensive type of containers are called sink mats. Because basically you are creating like a little pool where you put your art and you put it layers of mat on top and then there's no way that that cell art will have going to contact with anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, you do want to create the space between your your artwork and the glass. And is it best to have a divider between drawings or paper, or is stacking them against each other okay? And if so, what materials would the dividers be? I think it is better to have because then. Um, you don't know what type of like discoloration is going to happen depending on the media and that will migrate to the drawing next to it or you know you get the stains depending if you have charcoal or pastel then yeah dividers yes and any acid free paper is good enough to put between drawings for any type of media and in some case what you want to avoid what Miriam was talking about is the buffer paper in some cases you don't want to put because that's um, more alkaline and that can have an impact on color change in some of the pigments. For example, in blue pigments, it can have a really bad effect and completely change that color. Then it's always acid free to avoid changing the colors and in the pigments. Yeah. So we have another question here. What about file cabinets? When our office burned down, mm -hmm. a lot of the paper survived if it was in metal files. Yeah. I've been using fireproof file cabinets, but your comments 
uh, worry with your comments, I worry about them being too airtight. So I wouldn't worry too much about file cabinets. Um, the recommendation is to inspect them regularly, right? So you, just by looking at them, you'll give them enough ventilation. You're going to take care of the climate around in the room that they're going to be stored in. Um, so as long as you are taking care of temperature and humidity and regular inspection, file cabinets are a great place to store your, your artwork. Great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so a lot of um, chat about the Itoya or Itoya, sorry, portfolio. It says a top loading clear polypropylene sheet. So it's sealed on three sides and PVC free construction and quality crafted black acid free mounting paper provided for each space for each page. Can you speak specifically to concerns, any concerns you would have regarding long term storage with that art or those materials? So um, that's great detective work. That's the first thing I do is like, what is the manufacturer or the vendor telling me is included? What materials? Then I go look into the, some of the resources I put in the chat and see is proper, um, sorry, polypropylene a good plastic. I'll double check on that. Now you're telling me it's a three-sided seal. So it's a U sleeve, is that what we call it? Because it looks like a U. Um, I'm going to check, do I want to have a U sleeve? Do I need that? Or do I prefer an L sleeve? It depends on what I'm doing. Am I moving with it? You want a U because it, then it doesn't fall off. But if you're just storing it flat on the flat uh, file, you want your sleeve to be an L to allow for more ventilation. So that is the difference in that case. The one thing that concerned me was the black paper. It's mm -hmm. acid free. But what's in the pigment of the black color? Yeah right? Acid free does not mean it's acid free now, but will it remain acid free in the future? So that's one of the, the things that worry me. Anytime you have a pigment on paper, you worry about how it will behave later as it ages. Great. So here's a um, question a little different. The, is there a particular buffered paper you recommend to put between? Um, you just mentioned, you know, being concerned about a black paper because of the pigment. Um, I know that um, some of the archival stores sell products um, yeah. that specifically are made to do that. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? Miriam, I don't know. I mean, any good quality acid-free paper, it's okay. You know, sometimes you don't need, if you have even copy, you know, like, copy paper and it's acid free, you know, you can, because it can become really expensive, you know, if your artwork is not too big, that's good enough. If not, if you go, um, some of the vendors that are in the resource page, you know, they, they sell bigger sizes, um, you know, big size that we use in general for the book binding and those are, you, I think if you buy bulk, it's better price and then you can cut it to the size you want, you know, and you don't need, then you will have, there you will see seven milli, mil, grams or 80 grams. And I think it, the lighter, the better, you know, so you avoid a lot of weight on your work, you know, especially if you are interleaving a lot. But yeah, the, the, I think the resource page, Jenny, that will be available where the resource page? Uh, go to cartoons.osu.edu and resources and then preserving your cartoon art. Yeah, and nice. Yeah, and I think you can find there. Brought up a good point that that I didn't include in the presentation, which is if you're stacking things, to to be mindful of the weight. The and weight. One of the reasons why interleaving papers tend to be very um, uh, thin and light. Mm -hmm. What about glassine? Oh, that's another controversy. <laughs> um, so glassine or not to glassine? That's the question. So we tended to like glassine because it was very low texture paper, it was very smooth, and it would protect stuff that may have uh, maybe some friable material, right? But glassine is made by overbeating the paper. So mm -hmm. we're cutting the paper fiber, really, really short fibers. That's what causes the transparency in it. The more you cut paper fiber, the higher the degradation of that paper will be. So if you're using glassine, then make sure that you are looking to see if it's yellowing and then change it. 
often. So it's not the cheapest option because you do have to replace uh, it from time to time. Because of its inherent vice, the very way it's made, it will cause issues in the future. Miriam, Good there, for is, now. there is other type of very thin paper. I cannot remember the name that acid-free is opaque, but you can mm -hmm. look also in the vendors and that's much better than glassine. Yeah. And it's very thin. And then the concern is like, if you have a book and you are interleaving a lot, then you, you know, this, you are like swelling where you are interleaving and then the spine will try to break because you are interleaving and you are growing the thickness of the book, right? Then the thinner the paper it is, the better, but also be mindful of how much you are going to interleave. So um, someone wants to learn about doing some uh, conservation and doing it properly. Are, where, can, where can this person learn those skills? Do you have any resources or recommendations? Well, uh, to actually do conservation, or let's talk about, learn more about preservation. So we do have some resources right off the bat. It's the, um, the NEDCC preservation leaflets that are in the resource guide those will be a good place to start. I also put a link to Connecting to Collections Care, and that is a great resource, all kinds of information on how to take care of your collection. Um, if you're really interested in a career in conservation, follow up with us. It, it's an absolutely fascinating career, but it's pretty challenging to get into it. And we, we are finding, trying to find ways to make career paths a little easier into the profession. Um, so also you could go to the AIC website. Marcela, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that? Um, the American Institute for Conservators? Yeah, you know, the, yeah, the American Institute for Conservation for Art, works of art and cultural heritage. I think mm -hmm. it's that, and now they change it. It's the Foundation for the American Institute of Conservation. They change the name all the time. It's the association that groups the conservators in different areas, furniture conservators, ph photograph conservators. And there you can, um, we have conferences annually and people from different institutions, um, you know, bring their presentations, case studies and uh, in the different, areas of conservation and that's a that's in the resource page and you can navigate a little to see what the profession is about and what resources are there and some of the things that are in the resource page will be listed there as well there are resources to where you can see um see so yeah, conservators uh, how people um, do preventive preservation, giving guidance on how to take collect care of your collections at home. And I think collections care might be in there as well listed, probably in right near you. And a lot of the things we are putting in the resource page will be listed in that page. Then if you go to the AIC web page, it will guide you to many other sites for you to learn more about preservation, which is the preventive measure. and conservation, not because you can do the conservation treatment, but to get familiar, because then when you are going to talk with a conservator, you want to understand um, a little what they are talking about. Then if you get familiar about the terminology and, oh, people are, if they tell you, oh, we need to wash this and we need to do mending and we need to do flattening, if you get more familiar with those terms, then you can have a richer conversation if you want it and understand what will happen to your artwork. Yeah. Yeah, so it, for, it, just to follow up, preservation is like a healthcare network. We have doctors yeah. like Marcela. You have hospital administrators like myself. We need all kinds. We need images. We need technicians. Yeah. So there is a universe, and just ask us, and we'll, we'll direct you in the right place. Yeah. So we're, we're running out of time. I've, I've seen a couple of questions about, um, you know, if something says acid free, if it's a, a kind of pen that says waterproof and fade proof, um, are, are the, if it says that, is that okay? Does that mean that it's, um, it's going to be less risky in terms of its inherent vices? What do you think, Miriam? Yeah, go ahead. I think you, you may want to test it. You know, if, if it says it's, what, it's not water soluble, so take a little scrap of paper, test it out, wet it, see what it does, right? 
Um, in terms of when it says acid free versus when it says buffered alkaline paper, as Marcella said, acid free is very good for now. It's just that you may want to consider replacing acid free if you don't know what the alkaline buffer uh, quantity is in the paper so that um, you still get the benefit of an acid free paper that's absorbing acidity from its neighbors or in the microclimate. It's cheaper that way sometimes. Um, sometimes it's not, depending on how, what you're buying. But um, it's easier to get a little bit at a time, right? When we're talking about buffering, we have a known time, amount of time, where we know the next 50 years, this is going to be great in this particular container because we know what type of uh, materials are in that uh, rehousing uh, supply. Yeah, there is a question about protecting photographs, and they are asking about the buffer on and buffer. This is, um, yeah, what's better for protecting photographs of artwork, etc. Glossy and matte, buffer or unbuffer paper. Always unbuffer for photographies, never buffer paper. Because you want to look at something that's called PAT, photo activity test, right. and a good supplier of archival material for photographs that will have a PAT um, description in, in the catalog. Great. Well, we've reached, uh, uh, we actually went over. We had so many great questions. I really thank everybody who's participated. Um, and uh, we're, uh, hope, hope you, hopefully you learned something and, and can maybe get some takeaways from, from everything. So I want to thank Miriam and Marcella, you guys, um, are wonderful and we're so lucky here at the Billy Ireland um, to be able to work with you and uh, all the work that you do with our collections. We're just uh, very grateful for that. So thank you both very much and thanks to all of our uh, attendees and enjoy the rest of Cartoon Crossroads Columbus. Bye. Bye. -bye.